Thank you for attending the second of the sessions of the conference uh, this, uh, this morning. And the second session is a session that follows very nicely from the keynote lecture given by Vera Songwe, uh, which, and this session will be on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on African economies. And this will be a panel discussion. I would like really like to see a lot of interaction in the panel, lots of questions from the audience. Uh, and if you have any questions, please put the question in the Q&A box. That's where I can see the questions. If you put in a chat function, it's more difficult for me. So thank you for your, for your understanding. Now, just to give you a sense of the panel and the structure of the panel before we get to the specific question and before I introduce the panelists, um, what I think is important has already been discussed in the earlier session in the keynote lecture is we need to have a better sense of what's happening in terms of growth, public debt, international trade, supply chains, investment, and so on. These are the things that are, are, rec are recurring questions that are coming up when you think about the effects of the pandemic on African economies. And in this panel, we'll try to have some sense of, we, we still have a problem that we don't have enough data yet, but we're getting a good sense now of what we might expect to see in the next few months and next year. So it'll be really good to reflect a little bit about what will we already know a little bit about pandemic's effects and what we need to know in the future. And what should we do in that case in terms of policy solutions? So now let me introduce the panelists first, and then I'll get to where we're going to, how we're going to structure the panel. So we have a very distinguished panel, set of panelists here, and let me introduce them uh, in no, no particular order. So let me start with Mario Pezzini. Mario is a director of, of the of OECD. Um, Mario has been, and so he's a director of the OECD Development Center, a special advisor to the OECD Secretary General on Development. Mario has been professor of industrial economics at the Ecole Nationale Supérieure de Mines de Paris, and as well as in US Italian universities. He served as an advisor in the field of economic development, industrial organization, and regional economies, international organization, and think tanks, for example, ILO, UNIDO, European Commission, and so on. Maybe just a word about the OECD Development Center. Um, it's an institution where governments, enterprises, civil society organizations inform and discuss questions of common interest. So it's a forum for where different uh, member countries get together on discussing questions of common interest around development. Its governing board, uh, board includes most of the OECD countries, but also, and very importantly, developing and emerging economies are full members. The center helps policymakers in OECD and partner countries find innovative solutions to the global challenges of development. And of course, Mario will, when he, when you, uh, when he speaks in the panel, will reflect a little bit on what the OECD Development Center has been doing in the area on the COVID, the pandemic's effects on African economies. Now let me move on and introduce Dr. Stephen Karingi. Dr. Stephen Karingi is currently the Director of Regional Integration and Trade Division of the Economic Commission for Africa, UNECA. He joined the United Nations in April 2004. Before joining the United Nations, Dr. Karingi was a Senior anal Analyst and Head of Macrams Division in the Kenya Institute for Public Policy Research and Analysis, KIPRA. Before KIPRA, Dr. Karingi served as a Lecturer of Economics at Egerton University. The current experience policy research in a broad area of, uh, area of areas within UNECA as a member of the editorial board, of the Journal of African Trade. But the current was a recipient of the Zold Kilman Visiting Fellowship of the International Tax Program of Harvard Law School in 2001, and the winner of the 2013 Alan A. Powell Award, recognition's contribution to global economic analysis, issues from an African perspective. Dr. Karingi has served as a member of the high-level board of experts on the future of global trade governance and is presently serving in the high-level group on trade that is now looking at EU-African relations. Dr. Karingi, very pleased to have you in this panel. I would like now to introduce Dr. Moses Kiara, CEO of the Kenya Investment Authority. Dr. Moses Kiara is the managing director of the Kenya Investment Authority, Can Invest in Short, a position he took on 11 February 2013. Can invest the state agency charged with responsibility for promoting both foreign and domestic investment in Kenya, facilitating investors and policy advocacy with respect to investment in the country. Previous Dr. Ikara was the executive director of KIPRA and also policy, policy analyst at the same institute. Prior to joining KIPRA, Dr. Ikara was a lecturer in the School of Environmental Studies in Moy University. Dr. Ikara has substantial experience in public policy research. Have published has published about 38 papers and book chapters in various journals and other outlets. He's been involved in developing key policy documents of Kenya, and very importantly, the economic recovery strategy for wealth and employment, creation, 
2003, 2007, and the Kenya Vision 2030. Again, Dr. very pleased to have you in this panel. Now, let me just explain to you a bit of the structure of the panel so that you're all clear about how much time you need to, need to speak and, and, and so on. What I, will do, what I will do is I have three sets of questions for each of you. I will ask you two questions first, in the first round, and you'll have 15 minutes to respond. Then I think we'll have Q&A just to make it a bit more interactive at that point, allowing the audience to ask questions on your first interventions. Following that, then I'll get to the third question, in the second round, and then you have 10 minutes to respond. And again, we'll have Q&A. We'll, we'll break the Q&A a little bit because otherwise we won't have enough of audience participation. We really want the audience to ask us, ask all of you some really uh, important and good, uh, good questions. So if that's okay, we'll start the panel in that way. First round, 15 minutes of intervention, Q&A. Second round, 10 minutes of intervention, and then Q&A. If that's okay? Yes. All right. Now let me get to the questions. And let me start with uh, you first, Mario. Yeah. The two questions I have for you are as follows. The first question is, a number of African countries are already experiencing various economic challenges, and we already heard that from Dr. Songwe earlier today, before the pandemic. How has the pandemic affected economic performance in Africa? Question one. Question two. Several countries in Africa are struggling with a heavy debt burden, hence draining the resources needed to safeguard lives and aid the economic recovery. Again, we had heard a little bit about the public debt issues that are coming up in Africa. What is the role of multilateral agencies, OECD and so on, in addressing Africa's emerging debt crisis? The first question is about the effects on the economy as a, as a, as a, as a whole. The second is specific about the debt crisis. Now let me um, turn to Dr. Karing and ask, and ask you two questions. The first question is, and again, this is to do with your own interest in regional integration and international trade, uh, which is very important here. The first question is on foreign trade. So foreign trade is one of the sectors impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, following closure of borders and disruption of, of supply chains. Given your expertise and UNICA's role in promoting Africa's trade, and we already heard about the African free trade, the FCTA, um, what are the implications on regional, trade, regional and trade integration in Africa? How has the pandemic affected trade and regional integration in Africa? First question. Second, and this is very much linked to the first question, what is the role of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic? So would one say that the, the AFCTA progress has been stalled because of the pandemic, because of border closures, or are you optimistic that the progress that was already being made will carry on? So that's the second question. But I have questions to you again, linked to your own experience on investment. The first question is on this renewed zeal towards industrialization in many African countries. I mentioned in my uh, question to Dr. Songwe about the fact that we see a manufacturing renaissance in Africa and more recently. Um, so notwithstanding what we've seen before, how will the manufacturing sector in Africa, which is mostly agri-based and depend on imported intermediate and capital goods, how will the manufacturing sector, and perhaps more so in, in the case of Kenya, uh, be affected by the pandemic? And what will it do to the investment climate also in the industrial sector? Second question is not on manufacturing, it's on services. Service sector has been hit very pretty badly, especially tourism. So what strategy should be used to revive the service sector and perhaps more specifically the, the tourism sector, which is very important in Kenya. So I hope I got the questions across clearly. Uh, two questions for each of you. And 15 minutes to make an initial mention. You don't need to speak for all 15 minutes if you don't, if you don't have one to, because we can have more time for Q&A. It's absolutely fine. So shall we start? And over to you, Mario. Thank you very much. So to be sure, just because I'm a little bit slow, you know, we are a little bit earlier here in Paris. Uh, I have 15 minutes to answer the two first questions you addressed to me. Is it correct? Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Good, okay. Let me start with the first. Well, we know the numbers and we know that Africa region are affected uh, in, this, in the case of this uh, uh, crisis because the global economy contracted 4.2% and by comparison, Africa GDP contracted by 2.6%. So one may say is affected less 
Nevertheless, we are talking of 40 million people that could fall back into extreme poverty by the end 2021. So this crisis is affecting Africa because it's affecting Africa directly through the attack to the healthcare system and the capacity of people to avoid to be affected, but also because there are a series of external mechanisms that affect anyhow Africa and comes from the other regions. Uh, first of all, obviously the decline in demand. We have observed already with the crisis of uh, SARS that in that case, China reduced its internal consumption of uh, minus 3%. This time has been bigger. Uh, other countries, in particular the OECD country, are reducing their demand. And this is because the crisis have affected much more those countries than China and some Asian countries. And this means obviously that also the prices of natural resources, non-renewable that are exported by Africa are obviously either declining or anyhow in a phase of big turbulence. The crisis is affected from outside through tourism. It's very evident in the case of Capo Verde or the Mauritius, but in many more countries, this is the case. International trade is reduced. There are less commodity exports, but I would also add the movement of capital that is leaving developing countries to go towards more uh, supposed to be secure market. I will go back uh, on this point with the second question. So we can demand for export, fragile industrial capacity, and uh, obviously the health and human crisis, which is serious. But therefore, uh, the consequences in the short term are known. What could be the consequences for the midterm? Obviously, there are pre-existing vulnerabilities in the productive structures, and these existing vulnerabilities will be exalted. And so we know that Africa had problem in increasing productivity, in 2000, let's say, the productivity of Africa was 77, 67% of the Asian level of productivity, and now is only the 50%. So there has been a decline if compared with other developing region, and only 18 of new exporters survived beyond three years. So uh, this is a major uh, vulnerability, together with the lack of quality of jobs that has also a social uh, impact. Only 7% of African youth in the low income countries and 10 in the middle income countries in Africa have waged employment. So uh, these pre-existing vulnerabilities are going to continue. And we know that what is needed is obviously a productive transformation, as it has been underlined several times by my friend Stefan. I am very happy to be here with him and also with the new friends Moses. Uh, this uh, need for a productive transformation is very strongly there. But let me also say that, that there are some uh, possibilities that. Uh, this pandemic situation is also creating because it's creating a political momentum to accelerate Africa's digital transformation. African policymakers implement a host of digital solutions to mitigate the impact of COVID-19, and these are local, regional, and continental level. Uh, in health, the Africa Center for Diseases Control and Prevention in collaboration with 20 international partners, is working on diagnostic tests, is working on medical equipment. When it comes to education, Ministry of Education of 27 African countries were able to provide well-functioning e-learning platform for students by already May in 2020. And when it comes to finance, most African central banks strongly encourage the population to use digital payment. And we know that Africa has over 480 million mobile money accounts, which is in, that, in other terms, the region with the highest level in the world. So 
in all these cases, we see that there has been a strong capacity to react and that Africa can use those technology as it was done in the past to leapfrog in a series of areas. I would anyhow uh, stress that here, the crucial point is not that much uh, to concentrate on the digital sector production in itself. When you take the employment created in digital sector in itself, we are talking about 300,000 employees, which is nothing in respect to the enormous amount of youth that will join the labor market. What is crucial is obviously to be at the frontier when it comes to digital, but in particular is the dissemination and adoption and adapt adaptation of digital technology in other sector. This uh, could be a big passport for productive transformation in general. Now, let me uh, go to your second question that says, in a certain sense, how do we finance all of it? Uh, Africa's debt will likely soar to about 70% of GDP by end 2021. And it, this is up from 56.3% in 2019. So this average, uh, under my point of view, remains sustainable. Anyhow, there are strong tension when it comes to the debt concerning Africa. Uh, so Africa governments are facing uh, a lower financial resource capacity and uh, therefore the question of debt become even more crucial. Let me explain why. First of all, uh, uh, in, when we look at uh, the internal mobilization of resources in Africa, let's say taxes in Africa are relatively weak. If we look at uh, another developing region, I don't know, Latin America, the tax on GDP represent 23% of the GDP in average. There are big differences in Latin America as there are big differences in Africa. In Africa, we are only at 17%, between 16.5 and 17% in average, which means that the capacity of government to finance the policy that are required both to address the health crisis and to engage further in the productive transformation is limited. As I said, there are differences because when you look inside, you have Tunisia with 31% of tax on GDP, South Africa 29% of tax on GDP, and Morocco, just to make an example, is at 26, whilst Chile, that very often was quoted as a, an example of country capable to develop, is just a 24. Nevertheless, this capacity is limited. Therefore, external flows becomes particularly important. And when we speak about external flows, we are thinking first to foreign direct investment. But foreign direct investment are deemed to reduce severity. It is 10 years in reality that foreign direct investment are reducing due to the bad way in which we have addressed the crisis of 2008 that was actually not really solved before the COVID crisis came into the game. Uh, now, UNCTAD is thinking that the foreign direct investment will reduce of 40%, which is enormous. 40% in respect to what was before the COVID crisis. Secondly, remittances. Remittances are a crucial source of external financing for development in developing countries. And we economists, we tend to think that they are stable. They are not, for obvious reasons. There are countries that even, I don't, I don't like that approach, but even send back to the country of origin, the migrants. And obviously this means that the resources that were sent back home from outside are disappearing. Or even migrants that are in countries where the level of economic activity has reduced severely and therefore cannot contribute to send back money at home. In general, we think that the reduction in remittances will be more than 20%, between 20 and 40%. So also the source will be weakened. When it comes to official development assistance and other source of external resources, well, uh, this is uh, declining. It was declining even before uh, the crisis, but with the crisis, we decline for obvious reasons. As the aid 
are given on as a percentage of the national uh, GDP of the donor countries. And as these uh, national GDP will decline, therefore the volume of aid will decline as well. And probably that's what will happen also with philanthropy. As a general consequence, therefore, the external resources will also reduce whilst the internal mobilization of resources is weak. There is no alternative, therefore, that to address, at least in the immediate terms, uh, the debt as a way of financing the indispensable uh, action that are indispensable for Africa and for the rest of the world. Because if uh, only few countries will get out from uh, the uh, vaccine, from the uh, COVID crisis, they will get out for a limited space of time if the other will remain affected. Therefore, we have a problem of global public goods that needs to be put in place. As a consequence, I think that the way the issue of financing in large part will be at least in the short term, an issue of health uh, uh, financing the crisis response by managing the debt. And managing the debt means canceling in part the debt. The efforts of IMF, the efforts of the G20 are remarkable. They are not enough. And therefore, we have to continue to see how to handle these matters. And by the way, one way to handle these matters is not only to intervene at present with the cancellation of the debt, but also to rethink the functioning of the financial international system. Because as I was saying at the beginning, the level of debt of Africa was 50%. Now we will go up to 68, 70% is nothing if compared to what other country outside Africa have in terms of debt. It's enough to quote Japan, that is around 300,000, 300% of GDP, or many European countries that are well above 100%. So there is something in the financial system that is not working as it should. African countries tend to be, uh, uh, to have a rate of interest when they borrow that are much higher than other countries in other region of the world that have the same level of debt. So here there is without any doubt a thinking about the functioning of the general system. I don't know if I have answered uh, your uh, question. I don't know if I have used my 15 minutes, but I prefer in this case to give anyhow back the word to you in advantage of the discussion. Uh, thank you, Mario. That was very helpful and very useful. Uh, I think I took, uh, I had two takeaways from what you said, and of course there are several other points that you made. But one takeaway is that the effect of the pandemic is quite widespread, and it's not only on manufacturers, also on 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 uh, commodity sectors, on tourism, and so on. And therefore, we still haven't got a good idea yet how deep and how widespread the the crisis is going to be, because we haven't got the data as yet in in many countries. Other takeaway that I thought was very interesting was that, you know, we talk about the public debt being a concern in Africa, but as you mentioned, public debt levels are pretty high now in many European countries and in also in, in, the, in the US. So why is it more of a concern in Africa versus the West? And there you mentioned the nature of financial markets and capital markets and so on. And that's a really interesting point that we often don't pay attention to that part of it, that the debt is more of a concern because the nature of how we finance the debt and the constraints to financing it using domestic capital markets, for example. So I think we can go back to that point later. Now let me move on to, uh, to Stephen Karengi. Stephen, over to you. So the first question you asked me was on um, COVID-19 and trade, and I'll give a I'll focus on uh, Africa's trade. And then the second part, you asked me whether COVID-19 made it difficult for the AFCFTA uh, a challenge, or do we see the AFCFTA as an opportunity uh, in recovering from COVID-19? So essentially that is how I have um, structured this presentation. You may have seen this slide uh, from uh, Vera's uh, presentation. Um, I guess what I need to say is that the trip channel was one of the most critical when it came to impacting Africa's economies. And so we had a situation whereby uh, 
prices, uh, commodity prices collapsed for at least 67% or two thirds of African exports. Uh, the good thing is that as the economies started reopening, we were able to see some recovery, although for some commodities, especially oil, uh, the collapse, uh, I mean, the, 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 the prices before the COVID um, uh, are much higher than where they were at the end of the year uh, because, of, because of COVID. So you saw that uh, from Vera's presentation. But this slide here shows the kind of actions that African countries took. So just like other parts of the world, almost all African countries took some measures one way or the other that limited the cross-border movements. And we know this had a big implication on the supply chains within the continent, leave alone the supply chains that Africa, uh, the supply chains uh, uh, breakdowns that Africa was facing uh, with the rest, with the rest, with the rest of the world. So essentially, we have um, we have used this data from um, Oxford Coronavirus Government Response, and as you can see, they range from no restriction to ban on all regions or, or total border closures. And as you can see, most almost all African countries, especially between the months of April uh, to September, actually had very stringent um, lockdowns, and that impacted on what uh, we saw on trade. So again, you saw this uh, slide from Vera's presentation. What happened to Africa's trade with the rest of the world and what happened to Africa's trade with itself? Now, what I would want to emphasize here is that intra-African trade, even though it fell, it did not fall as much as Africa's trade with the rest of the world which is something interesting, and we'll come back to this issue when we talk about the AFCFTA. Again, when we compare this story with what happened during the financial crisis, again, we see some resilience on intra-African trade compared to Africa trade with the rest of the world. So there is a storyline here that the argument that deepening of intra-African trade is a critical pillar for Africa's resilience, is confirmed back in 2008 impacts and again during the COVID-19 COVID impacts. Of course, if you look at individual countries, this is a case of what happened to Uganda. So Uganda is one of those countries that has very good statistics on informal cross-border trade. And so it was possible to use the data that is collected by the Central Bank of Uganda to show how informal cross-border exports actually collapsed because of the pandemic. Now, again, there is a question that we have to ask ourselves here, and I can say later what we are doing with the African Union to address this issue. A lot of intra-African trade also happens to be informal. It also happens to be trade also that includes different segments of the African society. So if you have lockdowns that do not pay particular attention to the informal cross-border trade, you end up sometimes not understanding what is happening to those um, informal cross-border trader, informal, informal cross traders that you do not have statistics and data about. And again, I think I had Vera talk about the issue of identity, digital identity, because this is one of the aspects that this case of Uganda represents uh, that has been exposed by the COVID-19. Very quickly, the, not all Af African countries were affected the same way. If you had gold as part of your exports, uh, things were not as bad. If you had uh, most of your exports are petroleum, then things looked very bleak uh, for you. And I think this, um, I've shared this slide so the participants can be given and they can see for some countries that have a gold accounting for at least 35% of their exports, things were not as bad as for those countries where uh, petroleum oil accounts for at least 35% of um, exports. Now, um, again, in the keynote uh, presentation, we talked about the question of um, food security so what we observed because of um, COVID-19 
there were moderate rises on the global staple food prices. And this is because of Africa's dependence also in terms of some of its staples, especially rice and wheat from the rest of the world. And then we had all these supply chain breakdowns. Um, now, but the, 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 the positive story, if you look at the statistics that are being released by FAO, is that we seem to have avoided the food crisis of uh, 2008. In fact, as you can see in my chat, uh, we show the, what happened to the food prices on August uh, 07 to around November 08. Uh, and if you compare that with what has happened to, to the prices uh, of food, you know, you don't see the, the same kind of spike um, because of uh, COVID-19. COVID but then again, we are still in the pandemic. So I think we also have to put this uh, into context. So we talked about digital, I think uh, during the session and I think uh, Mario has also talked uh, about uh, digital and we'll come back to this issue when I talk about the AFCFTA. But just to say that for the continent, we have actually seen and observed how countries and companies have actually been able to adapt um, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the pandemic uh, through digitalization. So if you look at what has happened, uh, we see there has actually been a lot of uh, adoption. And I think this is the point, Mario, you raised that um, adoption becomes very critical. So we have seen actually an acceleration on the use of digital when it comes to, 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 to e-economy, but also this becomes a very valid issue when we talk about the e-commerce protocol that we, that we are hoping will be negotiated before the end of this year under the AFCFTA. And I'll come back to, to this as I talk now to the second part of the question, which is the role of the AFCFTA in the recovery. Now, so, the first thing is that the AFCFTA is going to help the continent to diversify away from commodity dependence because there are rules of origin within the AFCFTA, just like in any free trade area agreement, that we believe are going to be essential in the creation of regional supply chains, uh, which will make use of the raw materials and a lot of intermediate inputs that are produced within the continent. So, so that's the first point that we hope that the AFCFTA, and so basically what I'm saying is that the AFCFTA is going, is going to be a pathway out of the, uh, out of the, 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 the economic uh, impacts of the, uh, of, the, of the pandemic. The second thing is that it's going to drive industrialization. And as I'll show very clearly, we have done some simulations that indicate that um, industry is going to gain by between 36 and $43 billion um, in terms of intra-African exports just from the AFCFTA. And this is only in the context of removing the tariffs. We have not incorporated here what happens to the services trade and how that catalyzes even more manufacturing. And we have not uh, included in this simulation what happens to better market functionality because of the phase two issues, including the competition policy question and the e-commerce question that you raised during the keynote. And then of course, there's going to be better facilitation, trade facilitation and better transition to the digital economy. Now, these slides here basically gives the figure that I've given of between 36 billion to 43 billion by 2040 from the implementation of the tariff phase down under the AFCFTA. Most of that happening in industry, followed by agriculture and food, and then energy and mining. And I can come back and answer a bit more, but this is basically simulations that we have done based on the modalities that are being implemented under the AFCFTA. And we can break it down a little more to show what are those going to be the major sectors that are going to be to benefit from this uh, component of industrial industrial growth? So as you can see, most of it is going to happen in the vehicles and transport equipment. There's going to be a lot of that in energy. There's going to be a lot of that in metals, machinery, chemical products. And then of course, you can see towards the, the, the right panels of these um, slides, 
there's going to be a lot of agro industries and agro processing um, exports intra-African that are going to benefit from the AFCFTA. I want to come back and say that these simulations uh, do not capture the liberalization of services. And we know those services, uh, we have agreed to open up uh, various sectors in services sector. And we have not been able, of course, using the CG models to capture the implications of some of the e-commerce investment policies as part of this, uh, as part of these uh, simulations. And now I'm coming towards the end to say that um, it's not just going to be uh, the, uh, the, 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 the developing countries within the continent that are going to benefit, but also the LDCs within the continent are going to benefit. So in terms of the recovery from the pandemic through the AFCFTA, even the LDCs have a tool and an instrument to drive the transformation of the economy because we show that compared to the baseline, the African LDCs are going to experience a, a larger growth in terms of um, the industrial and manufacturing sector due to the AFCFTA more than the total for the continent or even the African non-LDCs. Non, non, non and finally, um, we had, of course, we asked the farms how the AFCFTA could help uh, boost cross-border e-commerce. Now, this is some work that we are currently doing. And the, this work was motivated by the idea that we need to lock in the adaptations that companies have, um, have experienced during this time of the pandemic. And basically what they say is that for them, the decarbonization of the laws for taxation, uh, consumer protection, these are issues that I had during the keynote speech, uh, harmonized laws on electronic trade, all these harmonized data standards, all these are going to be very important for them. If the AFCFTA e-commerce protocol could deal, could deal with this. And I would want to conclude by saying that um, we are at an advanced stage as ECA, working with the Africa Exim Bank uh, to develop a business to business e-commerce platform, which will work under the rules of the AFCFTA. And the way this is going to work is that the sellers and the suppliers through that platform would have to meet the rules of the AFCFTA, the rules of origin of the AFCFTA, but anybody can buy from that. And we believe this is going to be a platform that would be able to catalyze e-commerce. And it's also going to help SMEs, young people, and even anybody who wants to use the rules of the AFCFTA uh, to grow their businesses. So I hope I've been able to, through this presentation, to answer the two, the two, the two questions. First, on what happens to the, to, the, to the trade. And secondly, how the AFCA could help in the recovery. Thank you. Um, thank you, Steve. It was very interesting, factually very rich. And again, let me just sort of my two takeaways from your presentation. The one takeaway, and what's really interesting is the point about intra-African trade not being as bad affected as trade with the rest of the world. But then linked to that is the point you made about informal cross-border trade, because informal cross-border trade would probably be more affected by cross-border restrictions, movement of people, for example, than perhaps trade happens through uh, boats and, and, and so on. So that's an interesting point that the informal trade, uh, cross-border trade might have been more affected than the trade that happens through formal sources. And that's something we need to think about. The other takeaway I thought that was really interesting is the point, the work that you, you know, has been doing on simulating the gains of uh, trade by sector. And the point that you made that in sectors like machinery, automobiles, you seem to see, even in the most pessimistic scenarios, you seem to see significant gains. That's really encouraging because one, why is it encouraging? Number one, because those are the high value manufacturing sectors. Those are the technology intensive sectors. Number two, because the sectors are not as much of bad effect with the pandemic, that would mean that the AFC, uh, uh, the, the free trade agreement would help to cushion the blow of the pandemic that's happening in other sectors that we already, discussed, Mario talked about, tourism and so on. So actually the free trade ag uh, agreement might actually help to mitigate the effects of the pandemic if it, if it can push it forward in, a, in, a, in an accelerated way. So that's very encouraging also. Now, and that was very interesting, something that one wouldn't have known 
uh, if it wasn't for your presentation. Thank you so much for that. Let's move on to Moses and Chiara. Moses, you know your, you have your two questions, and if you want to make intervention now, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Kunal, for uh, for moderating very well. And uh, let me also start by recognizing uh, in my my friend and co former colleague Steve. Um, and also Mario for meeting him today. So it's very exciting to uh, to be to be able to participate in this uh, uh, in this presentation. Uh, second point I'd like to make at Scrocia. Actually, my my time at uh, Ken University ended yesterday. It was a bit too short to to hand over to the new person. So that's why. I, so I want to disclose that now as I speak. I'm not necessarily wearing the the, the art of uh, can invest. I've been there for eight years, uh, two terms, but uh, it's been really exciting to see uh, investment. Uh, you know what has happened. Uh, you know over the time. So uh, straight away, I go to the um, to the to the to the, my two questions. One is about, of course, the industrialization and the investment climate. Um, I think, as you, you rightly said, uh, Kunal, um, many of our countries' um, industrialization and also private investment are very, very, very important. Industrialization because of a promise of a job creation, which is maybe the, 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 the leading um, uh, socio socioeconomic stability challenge uh, of many people who don't have employment. And uh, in private investment because of the debt, you know, situation, public debt situation, where the you know uh, government is running out of space and has to rely much more on uh, uh, private capital uh, to come in and do the, uh, what is required. Um, I have been participating in Kenya. We created when the when the um, uh, pandemic uh, just became very tough in March of uh, 2020. Uh, we created a war room or a command and control center uh, where we were basically looking at uh, uh, what is happening, trying to manage disruptions in, uh, in, in, in business, minimize as much as possible, try to coordinate various prayers, you know, try to also prioritize interventions to see what you need to do first. So at the next intervention, uh, you can get a maximum uh, effectiveness out of it. Uh, and also, I was uh, in this uh, response uh, team, um, and we had, uh, you know, technical support from uh, McKinsey. Uh, um, I, uh, most of you know McKinsey. So it's, uh, we, we we did well, and we were able to to try and uh, maybe reduce the impact that, uh, that could have uh, um, been uh, been very very terrible. So let me say that. Um, Initially, we were seeing uh, about up to 80% of uh, uh, industrialization, industry jobs uh, vulnerable. Of course, depending on how the, 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 the COVID, the pandemic, uh, you know, and developed. Um, I think maybe the, the final outcome is uh, this work going on to, to, to look at the data, the very, very clear to see where we are, but maybe it's not as bad as uh, initially, initially feared. We, we also, at that time, when uh, after doing a small survey, we found, uh, especially in the essential goods category, where about 70%, uh, there was about 70% decline in demand. So you can imagine uh, a sector facing that. For an essential, it was even worse, where we had about 91% decline in demand uh, at some point when we were doing uh, this survey. So the, the, the industry was uh, quite hit, and the, 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 at our analysis, uh, the, the sectors we found most sensitive were food products, beverage, tobacco, uh, textiles, and apparels. And you can see these are most of the things that we, we export, and when uh, travel was disrupted, when uh, there was hardly any movement with lockdowns uh, all over, uh, obviously this was affected. We, and, and we, the initial numbers was actually exports declining by up to 25%. Uh, and the imports about um, uh, 3 to 4%. So um, 
we, we uh, I think not only Kenya, but I, I think I can speak about Kenya more because I was uh, more involved in that, where we, we came up with very quickly a stimulus uh, package program, uh, basically to give industries, uh, you know, some uh, tax breaks, uh, including also paying them uh, refunds, tax refunds that had been there for a long time to just give them a liquidity. Uh, we started promoting more by Kenya, beyond Kenya, uh, because uh, I think we really wanted to, to create awareness so that uh, there can be uh, local consumption which would, which would sub, uh, substitute for exports and then, and then removing the, 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 the logistics uh, challenges that, uh, that were there. And also reducing, because we did had uh, so many interventions because we started thinking of uh, of a proper stimulus package, uh, more or less like the first week uh, when the when the crisis uh, uh, hit us. So, um, for the situation, what do I see? Yes, the big problem was that uh, it was very difficult to get uh, inputs or imports that, uh, as you said, Kunal, that we, we depend quite a lot on important technology and the machinery. And uh, so that uh, uh, disrupted quite a lot. Uh, and there we see, you know, a potential where that uh, with the, with now the developments we have also, also seen at the AS, AS, ACFTA that um, we could actually see our investors can come in now that the market is even much bigger to start producing assembling and developing the machines and technologies that are required. When you have shorter distance in terms of crisis, it is much easier to move uh, those kind of uh, uh, capacity uh, within a, a, a continent or a region rather than maybe uh, going even uh, in uh, longer distances. Um, but another thing which we found uh, very interesting is also the ability, the capacity for innovation. Uh, within a very, very short time, we could see even small, um, uh, small polytechnics. Some polytechnics are small uh, institutions where they do basic uh, technical work, uh, turning themselves and being able to, to, to develop uh, 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 masks, you know, stitch masks and supply to uh, a lot of people who are desperate especially when it was very, it became mandatory to, uh, to wear masks uh, as you moved around. Uh, many companies also moved away from their traditional lines and started uh, a new line to manufacture masks or actually to also to manufacture, um, to manufacture um, these um, sanitizers. Yeah, it was uh, within a short time actually, the problem of sanitizers more or less disappeared because uh, and different companies were able to come in and, uh, and fill in the, uh, the space. We had even innovations, even in ventilators, uh, which are actually, um, uh, I think for the information I have is that they are working and I think they could become, uh, you know, very great technologies with a, with a, with a, with a bit of a, uh, more work. So innovation, we have actually been surprised by the, by the capacity uh, for, for to innovate that we didn't we didn't really appreciate before COVID how, how much it was. So it is now and this as a, as part of a, a post COVID recovery strategy, we actually are now promoting a lot of these groups to innovate a lot more and help them to commercialize uh, some of the uh, technologies that we have produced. We actually, it was surprising to see when we, we looked at our, the, the structure of the economy, what we are buying, what we are producing. We came up with a list of about 175 commodities that we could actually uh, produce internally and uh, without necessarily having to, uh, to depend on, uh, on, uh, on, on imports. So it was a, COVID was a real challenge. It just shaken the industry, you know, that we, we, we really, um, which is being looked for to, for to create employment and to create also market for farmers. But it has also uh, shown us, it has revealed the capacity and the potential that we have actually in our countries, uh, in Africa. What we need now, uh, and we have actually at the investment side, 
he looked at the real estate investment opportunities and started looking at um, uh, critical areas uh, that uh, private investor investment can be directed or, or can be can be uh, uh, nudged to go to ones. So, for example, machinery, uh, technologies. Uh, the health sector, you know, space, which was uh, quite weak, uh, among other areas. So um, I think I, I'll, I'll go to the next question, um, which is uh, which is on, but, but before I go to the next question, the key things that we, of course, affected the industrialization is, uh, as I said, is uh, supply chain dis disruptions downsizing because of the reality that was, that was there, uh, revenue decline and the, the related uh, challenges. But uh, we were able to see with a strong command center where you are looking at uh, what's happening on a daily basis and getting uh, reports coming from the, from, the, from the field, you can be able to, to minimize and guide the process. The second idea is uh, tourism. Again, this is a key sector for Africa. Um, we in Kenya is contributes about uh, ten to eleven percent of, uh, of of GDP. This is an important sector, and this is one of the sectors that was really very very hard hit because of uh, people could not travel and because of the uh, restrictions. Even in domestic, uh, even local people could not uh, move from one part of the country to another, so it also affected the um, uh, domestic tourism uh, to, a large, to a large extent. Um, but uh, the, the encouraging thing is that uh, demand for Asia and the travel remains very strong. Uh, if you ask uh, many people, I think uh, at a personal level, to say what they, they hated the most about the COVID, was the fact that they had to really be restricted within their homes or within small spaces for long and they could not go on holidays. And, they, and so, uh, so that demand is, uh, means that the, 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 the sector has a lot of uh, uh, still hope. Uh, of course, with the vaccine, uh, the vaccine um, um, news was good, although now the, that is being dampened with what you have seen about the new strains of, of the virus that are not uh, uh, being, um, um, I mean, they are resistant or they couldn't, the, the vaccines are not able to be effective against them. But nevertheless, the sector, what uh, the question you ask is how can we revive this sector? The first thing is for me, I think it's good to have a, a specific um, tourism sector or services sector task force, which is basically looking at what is evolving on a continuous basis, what are the emerging opportunities, uh, what can be done uh, to, to, to take advantage of these uh, emerging opportunities, how to, to, to help potential companies not let them go under if they are, they, are, they are strong and they need only support for a short time of period to be able to be back on, um, uh, on, 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 on uh, strength again. So, so that kind of task force, uh, people focusing, nothing else but really monitoring what's happening is very critical. The second, of course, to, to, to maintain um, uh, online uh, destination visibility because we believe COVID will eventually uh, go away. And you don't want to start from scratch to, to promote your destination after the COVID. You want to still want to maintain, um, even if it's only uh, virtually, uh, that uh, uh, visibility. Uh, we, the other area is to really look more on, uh, on uh, what you have domestically. The African tourism sector has been largely uh, biased you know, in favor of foreign tourists. Uh, but many of the economies now with the rising per capita incomes and the disposable income, they present a very strong market. Uh, we've seen that as well, you know, conferencing and other types of uh, domestic tourism. All that needs to be done is to, to repackage the products because the, the tourism product that appeals uh, to somebody from Finland, you know, and started the same that appeals to, to a Kenyan tourist. So you just need to be able to repackage those products uh, to make sure that uh, um, uh, we can capture more of the domestic market. 
and then to, to, to ensure the standards in hospitality and the food sector are maintained, hygiene is maintained, so that again, uh, you don't have, a, you can manage a reputation a risk uh, by doing this. Diversification of products is very crucial. And then uh, a well, well decided financial support packages is very, very essential because sometimes the difference between uh, life and death of an enterprise could be a matter of a couple of months. Um, so support is required to be able to step in in those short moments of support so that we can be able to save uh, you know, good businesses uh, for future growth. So I think, uh, I hope I've uh, 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 been able to respond to your questions, Kunal, well. Uh, I'll be looking to hear if there are, there are further questions uh, on the same areas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Moses. Thank you so much. I can, I, I mean, let me just go again, take then, uh, what I take, to, the two points I, I would take from what you said. First, what you said about investment and particularly imported capital goods. So, and this is not only true for only Africa, it's true for other developing countries, other developing regions. They're very dependent on imported capital goods from the West, from Japan, and, and so on. And the, and the pandemic has had a big effect on, on trade. So, so in a way, investment has been affected because you can't, as a firm, in, import capital goods, which you need. Uh, and that is an interesting point, the link between trade disruptions, the pandemic, and then, and then investment. But of course, we also heard from Stephen's presentation, maybe with AFC, FTA, that might change a little bit if you have more Domestic uh, machine, uh, more product, domestic production of machine goods following the integration integration initiative. So that's interesting. So we have to see what happens in the future. The other point that you made, which I think is really good, that the tourism sector has obviously been hit, but there is also the argument there's a pent up demand for travel. Once people can travel and yeah, travel yeah. ease, and people are remote, people are vaccinated, and so in a sense, people there is already some work, uh, data on this. A lot of people are saving, especially in the West. In, in anticipation of spending on leisure in the future. So the point really is that one has to protect the tourism sector now, find a way to, buff, to protect it now, because the demand will increase quite sharply. Absolutely, yeah. Could be a few more months, could be next year, we don't know. Yeah. That pent up demand is there, and therefore it's important not to lose the tourism sector and might find ways to, to buffer it from this short, perhaps a relatively short term impact of the pandemic. So that's a really important yeah. point. And, I think that's worth keeping in mind when we discuss the effect on the tourism sector. All right, now I'm going to do, if, that's, uh, if I'm okay with uh, Mario, uh, Stephen, and, and Moses, I have questions already in the Q&A from audience, the audience, and I can see the questions are kind of very nicely target, uh, are aligned with the interests that each of you have. I'm going to ask one question to each of you from, the, from what I've received from the audience, and I will let all of you know the, what the questions are just for you to think about them. But again, I'll start with Mario. So, Mario, the question that is there in the, in the, from the audience is that, as you said, you know, we need to think about expenditures and obviously given the situation with the fiscal situation and so on, then the question then would be, how do you prioritize expenditures? Which sectors do you invest in? And this is not only the private return, but the social return the investment. So, question linked to that is that, is there any work that the OECD Development Center has been doing on social returns to investment in particular sectors and can one think about how to prioritize different sectors? If one had a, the governor a certain limited amount of funding, what would, where would you spend the money on? So that's your question. But let me, before I let you speak, answer that question, let me give the question to Stephen to think of. That's a quite a difficult question, actually. Stephen from you has come from the audience. So this somebody obviously works with CG models. His name is Avi Kedir. Uh, he asked the question that what are the implications of the AFC FTA on skill versus unskilled? Uh, labor or trade in unskilled, unskilled labor. So the skilled differential is a really interesting question because we know that on CG models, you can say something about that. So therefore, have, have, have you done some work on this? And if so, what would be the, your expectation on the skill impact of the, the FCFTA? So that's a very specific question to you. Uh, to Moses, the question is as follows. So the question has come to the audience is about digital technology and the concern that it might leave some people behind, right? Because we believe in the UN, leave no one behind. So it might leave women behind, it might leave the youth behind, it might leave people who are relatively illiterate behind. And this is a really important question in Kenya. 
or exactly as we heard from Rasongi earlier, Kenya is the leader in many of the digital technology. So is there a concern that digital technology, much as it's so remarkably transformative in, in the case of Kenya, can actually leave some people behind? And then what does one do about it? Okay, so we've got really three great questions from the audience. So let's start with Mario, the question for you. Thank you. Uh, recall to me, uh, Kunal, please, how, how long do, uh, can I speak? Five minutes, is that okay? <laughs> Five minutes, okay. Uh, it's very, very tough. Okay, let me start by saying that the question is really appropriate. Uh, in the sense that for many years, decades, the international organization have discouraged countries, developed or developing, by doing any form of planning, thinking that the market would have found itself the different incentives to orient the decision of investors. And this was wrong, because in many cases, the market is not necessarily the best in suggesting what to do. And in particular, in countries that produce national resources, because all the incentives goes to specialize and actually become dependent from the production of natural resources. And we know what are the consequences in terms of Dutch disease that this type of situation can engender. Therefore, uh, I am uh, abs uh, absolutely convinced that we have to rethink collectively how any strategy for developing countries and for countries in general should be designed. I'm not obviously pretending that all the problems existing today are simply internal domestic issues. I, I obviously must recognize, in particular when we speak about COVID, that there are general mechanisms that affect the capacity of countries to decide where to go. Nevertheless, this dimension is crucial. How to build, therefore, a strategy for a country uh, as we have dismantled a series of knowledges that we have, we have put in place. In the Development Center, I launched uh, some 10 years ago, something that is called multidimensional country review. I agree, it's a very bad name. That's what my mother is telling me all the time. I don't understand my son what you are doing. Yes, in practice, we help countries to define strategies. And obviously we don't pretend to tell what is the strategy, but to work together. Why? Because in many cases, the bottleneck to development, the traps that prevent further development are specific, are context specific. So you cannot identify, as it was pretended by the Washington Consensus, 10 laws that maybe you can write in stone and then pretend that everybody has to use the same. So first of all, what we need is to understand what are the specific assets that a country has, what specific asset a country can create, and very often not even a country, but a place. In fact, a very important crucial dimension is the local dimension. In my country in the 60s, we used to identify the major uh, investment to be made, and we turn out to produce cathedral in the desert. Simply not because the market is better, but because the central government doesn't have necessarily all the information required to understand what are the opportunities that exist in a place and remain un unexploited. So I think we have to reinvent the mechanism of, of designing strategies and vision involving the people. Look what is happening in many countries developing and developing. People in the street asking to have more voice. And that's exactly what we need to build in a certain sense with a new tool. Now, stated that, which is very general, I don't want to duck the question. Let me just uh, give me three minutes and I will say the following thing. I mean, an economist uh, uh, landing on Africa from the sky and pretending, unfortunately, that's a real vice of a series of my colleagues, to tell country what they have to do even without knowing the country. They will start by saying, oh yes, natural resources are the comparative advantages of Africa. But we know that this will not provide an answer for long. Productivity is declining in the mid and long term in this sector. And moreover, what type of employment are you creating? And what type of dependence of Africa are you reproducing? 
So others are saying, I use the global value chain and I like all the things that Stefan said about obviously uh, trade, but remember 69% of the growth of Africa came from internal demand. This is a great, great present, a great, a great thing that needs to be exploited further. Therefore, uh, yes, global value chain. Let's think about regional also value chain and how they can be organized. Nevertheless, that penetration remained very weak. So some are saying, okay, why don't you create some free zones uh, imitating what has been done maybe in China, and then you attract foreign direct investment, why free zones? Because the problem of firms is not necessarily what they do inside. Go around African towns and you will see how, how work the entrepreneurs I mean, people that are heroes, they work every minute of the day to find solutions to the problem that are not their willingness to work or their capacity to be entrepreneur. It's the local environment that is not providing all the resources that you need. When you are a small entrepreneur, you cannot do everything inside. Therefore, you buy from outside. But if the outside is weak, where do you find logistics? Where do you find an accountant? Where do you find a center to control quality of products? Where do you find a center that inform you about the trends of, of fashion? You have to do everything alone, unless you have an environment which is good. So some people say, let's build a free zone so that at least there we can control and we can put an environment that is helpful. Many economists obviously speak about an environment conducive to growth. In reality, they think how to modify the legislation so that big investment can come from outside. Okay, that is important, maybe helpful. But in reality, a lot has to deal with the local environment. Now, apart from free zones that you can build many, but you cannot answer all the need through the tools. And obviously I like very much the work that Arkeve Okubai has done in Ethiopia and also theorizing about it. Uh, but uh, for me, we have also to take into account zones where there are already small firms, very often informal, concentrated, and there do industrial policy, not in terms of, obviously, financing is always important. No? Uh, it says you go to see a doctor and you ask, what do you want to be better? So what do you want? More money. Okay, fine. But then what you need is, in reality, services real service, the center of control of quality, it's the technician that tells you that there is a new innovation that maybe you could adopt. These type of policy are desperately needed. Sorry to be long. No, Mario, I think you made some really, really good points there. I mean, the point that made about the fact that often think of Africa having this corporate advantage in natural resources. Well, that might've been in the past, but that's not long, no longer in the future. For one, as I, I said earlier today, there is a manufacturing renaissance going on. And secondly, also, we see increasingly now declining commodity prices, move away from non-renewable energy sources. So surely uh, it has to be the case that corporate advantage cannot dictate the way you want to go in the future, right? That's all. Uh, so that's a very good point. The other point you made, I thought was ex excellent, that often there's a preoccupation with special economic zones. And, you know, we, of course, seen a success in China, for example. And actually, to be honest, you haven't seen special economic zones being successful elsewhere in the world. Um, there have been dismal failures in India, for example. So yes, in Africa, I think Ethiopia is a good example where it have worked, but one should not only focus on special economic zones because you're creating kind of a very a bubble and that's not what you want. You want this more generalized investment climate reform that are all firms to, to do well, especially the domestically, domestic firms. So that's a really important point that we can come back to later. Um, let's move on to Stephen. Stephen, so you have a very specific technical question on, on CG modeling. Do you want to take that now? No, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks to my friend, uh, Kadir, for the difficult question. Um, so to say the following, in the results that I have uh, presented, there is a possibility to go to another layer and I'm just going to the technical part, uh, because we know in every country, uh, you have um, household um, survey data. So it is possible to take the macro results that we have from these um, simulations that have given the three scenarios. And through a micro simulation model, be able to show what is happening 
for the different segments of households, which of course would be a good representation of the labor market. That part of the analysis is not done. So, so at the moment, uh, what I can say is that in 2013, we did some initial work uh, with ILO and FAO. We published a book, it's a book published by ILO and FAO. Um, it's called Shared Harvests, Trade, Agriculture, Employment. Some of you may have seen it. You can actually see it, uh, it's online. And in chapter eight, what we tried to do was even before the negotiation started, started speculating on what some of the simulations uh, scenarios would look like. And in chapter eight of that publication, we have some focus on agriculture because if we were working with FAO. And so what we were able to demonstrate at that time before we knew how the modalities would look like was that actually, unskilled workers in the agriculture sector would actually benefit from the AFCFTA at, uh, at, at, at that point. But of course, um, as we know, the, the distribution of these gains uh, uh, um, depends on what sectors are gaining and what sectors are losing. And that is why this second layer of a micro simulation analysis is, uh, is, 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 is so critical. So Abby, just to disappoint you, we have not done that second part of the simulation. But the good thing, the good news is that the World Bank, towards the end of last year, produced some additional analytical work on the AFCFTA. And basically what the World Bank has done, they do the, the, the same scenario. I, well, I, the, the scenario they do using their, their CG model uh, is much more ambitious that, than what is agreed in the ASCFTA today. But then they go to the second level where they actually disaggregate the labor market, including by gender. And if you look at the, 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 the work of the bank uh, from, uh, that they published towards the end of last year, they do actually answer the question you are asking, Abby, both in terms of um, what happened to the skilled, work, to skilled workers and unskilled workers, and uh, they go to the extent of including the gender dimension of the implications of the AFCFTA. And the results are very, very encouraging, both for gender uh, inclusiveness, but also for the question that I also see of not leaving anyone behind uh, within, the, within the, the analysis. And this is because then they also capture the services liberalization. Um, so that's, that's, that's all I can say for now. That's really interesting. So this is the World Bank report. Is, is, that, is that right, Stephen? That's fair, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I, I can look for the title, but it's some work they published, uh, they, they, they released towards the end of last year. Um, and basically the scenario at the macro, we discussed a lot, uh, but then what they did, since they have the advantage of having the poverty service for the different countries in the world, they took that data and then um, uh, modeled, uh, you know, looked at the labor market for each of those countries and then imposed these macro results at a micro simulation level. And uh, they have very interesting results on what happens both by gender and also by la labor segments. Excellent, thank you. Oh, yeah. Moses, uh, the question was, uh, how can we make sure that we don't leave anyone behind with digital technology and particularly in the case of Kenya? Yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Kunal, and thanks to Paula for for that question. Um, I think I'll, I'll basically uh, answer this question in uh, two ways again. Again, uh, from the experience of Kenya, because this is what I have I've been doing every day. Um, first, I'll say I think the the focus on uh, creating digital villages, even in the most remote parts of the country, making sure there's electricity and making sure there are digital villages. So that in those villages, even somebody who is illiterate can go and say, I would like to do one, two, three, and there are people who can support and help them to, to do this. It's something we see all over in, in Kenya now because of the cypher cafes where somebody goes 
uh, then there are people who have never gone to school because of mobile money. They know how, where, where to press to be able to, to withdraw the money, eh? even if they, if they don't know anything else. So uh, that example has shown that uh, the risk of uh, leaving some categories behind because of digital uh, technology and evolution is minimal. Another example we've seen, um, some of the very informal, we call them micro enterprises of uh, lots of women, they, they drive by every day, 4 a.m. in the morning, they go to the, to the farm, so people supply produce, they buy it, then go and sell, they retail it, you know? And to get the money, they actually borrow every morning and they pay back at the end of the day, every day, and we are, they are left with a, with a profit. And they do all this uh, through, uh, through mobile phone, uh, and the financing uh, agencies are able to, to provide this uh, microcredit uh, in this kind of uh, uh, format. So the, that example, and the other one is uh, how we distribute um, uh, uh, with social support, like uh, uh, with, with cash transfers to the very handicapped poor who, who may not be able to, to work or do anything by themselves and they can only be sustained by, by cash transfers from government, they get it through M-Pesa, through uh, uh, mobile money, and they're able to, you know. So those two examples show you that actually in digital technology, rather than uh, having the risk of leaving categories behind, is actually a way of inclusion and they are bringing uh, everybody there. And then if you combine that now with the uh, digital uh, villages, uh, which we are, as a country, we are championing this, uh, then I think uh, the, the risk uh, can be minimized. And together with the uh, training, uh, there are a lot of uh, technical training institutes all over, so that people can even learn uh, basic things on uh, uh, digital skills and even the utilization of the tools. Thank you. I think that was very important, Moses, the intervention, your response, because it's really been quite remarkable how much mobile money, mobile banking, has penetrated to the poor uh, in Kenya, but also in many other countries increasingly now. And that's quite important to keep in mind that we thought that it might be that might be a challenge, but it hasn't really proved to be a challenge, particularly in the case of Kenya. And that's that's something other countries can learn from, I think. I have now a question again, Stephen, I'm sorry, you're getting very precise questions for the audience today. So there's a question which I thought was really interesting. The question was that, so the cr informal cross-border trade that we see has uh, declined in the pandemic would imply that border towns, like let's say Lesotho and South Africa, border towns in between uh, across the, two bo the border would particularly be affected because they're the ones who essentially, which are where the trade, informal trade is really happening to the border towns. So do we see evidence of that? I mean, do we have any even preliminary evidence that the border towns have been affected because informal cross border trade has come, has slowed down? No, thank you, thank you. Actually, there is, um, you know, the World Food Program. Uh, the World Food Program, as you know, they are the, the largest uh, logistics uh, uh, company, so to speak, in the, in the world. They do actually collect data uh, in some of these, um, some of these, uh, some of the countries, uh, and in Africa, they collaborate with institutions like the farming early warning system of the, that is run by the USAID, and they have massive amount of data that they collect um, that they collect um, uh, every day. So I happen to be part of the network. So is it network? But uh, an email list where the World Food Program normally shares. Uh, some of the data of what is happening, at least in Kenya, including the, the cross-border trade, um, especially where some of the refugees, um, um, some of the border towns where we have refugees or where they, 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 they cross. And the, and the evidence is that, yes, they are actually being, um, being impacted because as you know, um, when it came to the, to, the, to the closure of the borders, it was also the security, the, the security apparatus in most countries were actually activated. So it was very difficult for even informal cross-border traders to use what we call informal, 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 informal routes, uh, because the national security apparatus were also, were also uh, uh, impacted. So what happened 
and this is now where the adaptation uh, came in. Um, in West Africa, these informal cross-border traders basically organized themselves and they started aggregating. They started aggregating their, their, their trade, giving it um, to the, in one track and being received in the, on, the, on the other side. So instead of it being informal, it started becoming a bit formal. Uh, as a way of, uh, of adapting to the challenges of the of the of the, of the of the of the border closures. Now, of course, also, I talked about the acceleration of the digitalization. Uh, so, the the use of um, mobile money, uh, people moving now to mobile money so that they can be able to 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 to, to, to pay each other across the border, also became a way of coping uh, mechanisms. So it's true, the livelihoods were impacted, but like I said, um, there was also an um, sort of an adaptation by most of these border communities to try to minimize um, the, the, the impacts of the border, of the, of the closure of the borders and having to, to be on the wrong side of the law because of the, of the national apparatus being uh, there to enforce, to, to enforce the law. Now, so, so let, let me conclude by saying that um, we are currently working, again, I said we, we, we are working to come up with the African Union guidelines of facilitating cross-border trade. Now, why I'm talking about guidelines is because all of us are familiar with the trade facilitation agreement. The AFCFTA in the protocol of goods, one of the annexes is about trade facilitation. Now, the AFCFTA Trade Facilitation Annex is modeled on the WTO uh, Trade Facilitation Agreement. But the Trade Facilitation Agreement did not anticipate the health dimension of this cross-border trade. So the AU guidelines that we are developing now are basically taking on board the best practice that the regional economic communities have come up with to facilitate cross-border trade. And we hope we can actually have that uh, agreed at a continental level so that we can also take care of these informal cross-border traders, including some of those innovations of, the, of their own, of their aggregation of their, of their packages. Thank you. Thank you, Moza. Actually, uh, uh, thank you, Steve. Actually, you answered a kind of the question came from another, from another uh, uh, the audience about how will the FCA, FCT, FG handle cross-border trade? This another question comes from uh, Rose Fontip, and this is again goes back to the CG modeling question. Actually, that how do you capture cross-border trade in a in a model that can tell us about the effect of closure of cross-border trade on gains of gains from trade, losses from trade? So that, that'll be very difficult, I would think, right? Because you don't have the data you need to put into a CG model for doing that. Am I right? That's true. That's true. Because the, the data we use is basically the national accounts, uh, the, 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 the macro basis, the national accounts. And to the extent that it does not capture that, so you could actually be a diestimate or by estimate sometimes, depending on mm -hmm. uh, how macro uh, accounts were constructed. So that's correct. Yeah. It's something to think about as a potential research uh, area to get into, isn't it, for, futures, for students listening into this uh, panel? So perhaps there is a very nice PhD thesis out there that can be done on this, uh, using primary data, obviously. You need to collect your own data for this, to, to do that. Um, now let, sure. me, Moses, let me ask you a question, Moses, on an issue that actually also relates to what Mario also said. And the, again, the question from the audience about PPE. Like, uh, for example, this whole thing about that we know now that what we have seen for the pandemic is countries who didn't have PPE production was so much dependent on you know, other countries, China and so on. And that also leads to the question also on pharmaceuticals too, vaccine production, right? Um, I mean, Kenya has a pharmaceutical industry, um, but vaccine production has not really happened uh, there as far as one knows. So the question then, is there a, now one understands the importance of domestic production, domestic production capabilities, especially when one needs, sees that when this sort of pandemic, the pandemic happened pretty much countries close borders. And now we are also hearing about export controls of vaccines and so on. So what do we, what can you say from where you were in the Kenyan West about that question of building up domestic production capabilities, particularly around uh, PP and maybe even vaccine production? 
Uh, thank you very much. I could now for that question and uh, for uh, our colleague who has uh, asked that question. Uh, as I indicated, actually, one of the things we've come out with from the um, from the war room or situation room, as we call it, is actually to come up with a post-COVID uh, recovery strategy. Uh, and, uh, and one of the key things that have, has come is that uh, you know now greater focus on food, uh, medicine, pharmaceuticals, and the issues like the PPEs. Uh, that uh, you have to think now. Uh, in the future, if there was, a, and I know if this was to continue, or there was even another crisis like this, when there was no travel, you are not able to import and all that. What are the basic things that you need? And it looks like uh, every country needs to try and at least have some level of capacity to to be able to uh, to, to produce basic needs like you know food, some uh, some medicine, and and all that. So. Uh, PPEs, pharmaceuticals, actually have emerged, and even uh, um, the medical supplies, uh, sub equipment, have become the the like the, the, the most uh, at the top of the list now. Area where we are encouraging investors to go to. Uh, of course, the, the issue of the PPEs is um, whether you can sustain and demand. If you look at the entire situation where we didn't have COVID-19, uh, who do you sell the PPEs uh, to? Do we still have uh, that big demand uh, going uh, forward? And this is what we are discussing with um, as we package uh, the opportunity to investors. We have to, to project uh, whether there's a, a good demand uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a future without uh, COVID. Um, and the AFC CFTA again helps because with the 1.2 uh, billion people with now great awareness about uh, health, uh, I don't think we are going to go back to a situation where the level of hygiene uh, or basic care will be where it was uh, pre COVID. There will be high level, you know, people have come up with. Uh, uh, these uh, small equipment where you can uh, wash your hands uh, without uh, using your hands to touch anything. If it's something being used for many people, you step on one one pendle for the for the sanitizer or soap, the other one for the water, and these are things I think will be sustained going forward, regardless of whether COVID is there or not, which is likely to have a major effect on the status of. Uh, Public health, public hygiene in the, uh, in the in the not only Africa but also around the world. So uh, the simple answer is uh, yes. PPEs, pharmaceuticals are among the top now as areas we are looking at investment opportunities. But we are looking to see uh, whether even when you bring uh, the continental FTA uh, in the picture, whether you, you still have a strong um, demand that can. And sustain a, a size of investment. Thank you. Thank you, Moses. That point that you made at the last point you made is very important. That it is also not very useful. Every country specializes in producing PPE equipment. If you have AFC FTA, right? I mean, you want to have regional specialization, and then you have cross, uh, then you have inter, inter African trade. So that way, that also might be a bit of a mistake if countries are specializing in where maybe that's not in their best their best interest. So I think that's something to also keep in mind. And, and I think that's also costly specialization is also not a very good idea, right? Um, well, but, but before I leave this, Kudal, if you allow me just a few seconds, I sure, must remember yeah. that we've been looking at the pharmaceutical subsector even before uh, uh, pre-COVID. And Steve knows this because I know we have discussed with him uh, once or twice. Um, and the, the, the situation we find as a limiting challenge is that uh, when the global agencies that uh, buy medicine and is distributed to countries, often they are not buying from developing countries. Only in moments of crisis, they can buy from them, which means the quality is okay, but they only buy not all the time, but it's, um, at, the, at the moments when they don't have uh, an alternative. So I think uh, because we were, one of the questions we were looking at was, uh, what can we do to development uh, international agencies to be able to support this? This is one of the areas we need to see the global WHO and others who buy medicine and distribute it to uh, developing countries need to be 
uh, allocating uh, quite some level of demand and orders mm -hmm. to manufacturers in the developing world. Thank you. Absolutely. That's a very important point. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask you to actually, uh, for a, a third round where I was going to ask you a third question. Given that I'm getting so many interesting questions from the audience, if I, with your permission, um, uh, Mario, Stephen, and Moses, shall we carry on? We have about 14 minutes left anyway. And it's good to get the question of the audience and, you know, and it makes it more interactive. So therefore, Mario, I have a um, question for you. And you could also, in fact, reflect on the question that I raised about domestic production capabilities. I know you have a specific interest in that. So are we looking at a new industrial policy post COVID? So that's kind of one question you can think about. The other question that came from the audience is that, so we talked about fiscal deficits and they have increased post COVID, obvious reasons. But what is, a, what is a safe level of a fiscal deficit? When do we say, no, that's just too much? Is it 10% of GDP? Is it 15% of GDP? Is it 20% of GDP? Can one provide some kind of a marker on this? Or is it very country specific? So this is a tough question for you to answer. So you need to give us a, a kind of a, a marker that this range, this particular level of GD, uh, fiscal GD, uh, GDP becomes a problem for a country. So that's your, so you have two questions there. A new industrial policy post COVID and what would be the safe level of fiscal deficits you know, in this situation? Thank you. You got to unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Thank you very much. Let me start with the second, maybe, to say that in reality, there is no answer because in, in reality, uh, the question of the debt is very much the question of the financial system as such. And there, the crucial element is trust and how trust may work. So the point is, how do you can assure the condition of trust that allow you for sustainable debt uh, in, in specific conditions? So, we know that at present there are level, uh, countries like Japan that have a very high level of debt, but as this debt is mainly carried on by the internal Japanese population, then obviously you assume that the level of trust will continue for long, and in fact the mechanism doesn't put any specific problem at present. You have also in Europe mechanism uh, that continue to function despite a level of trust, because uh, despite a level of debt, because the trust that the European Union itself has been capable to create, then allow for level of the rate of interest that remain particularly low. And that's exactly the reason why I was mentioning the need to reconsider the function of the financial system, because is it capable to recognize and to rank the countries accordingly with their real capacity to produce trust and therefore at a certain point to pay back the debt? That's the, the major question. Uh, let me also say that uh, in this respect, the present mechanism of ranking do not necessarily help the countries because they are based on criteria that probably do not apply to all countries as they are. So uh, in, in more practical terms, we all do always refer uh, to, uh, to variables such as the rate of interest in respect to the tax that the country is capable to raise. So in a certain sense, we go back to a point I was just touching at the end of the first question. And this point was mainly um, uh, the uh, capacity of fiscal reform. Uh, let me be clear on this point. I am very uh, convinced that we need fiscal reform. I'm very convinced that uh, fiscal reform are possible. And uh, one of the reasons is exactly the observation I made before. If in average in Africa, the level of taxes out of GDP is very low, uh, there are countries where this is not the case. I mentioned Tunisia, I mentioned South Africa, I mentioned Morocco. Why they are so relevant? Because if they have higher level of taxes, it means that fiscal reform are possible. Now, the point is how to get there. Uh, and, and how to get there uh, is exactly the fiscal reform that needs to be put in place. I'm very pleased that together with the African Union, we have been uh, producing in the last year something that we call fiscal revenue statistics. 
because as we produce it also in OECD country, but also in Latin America and Southeast Asia, this allow to compare. And when you start comparing, you realize not necessarily that you have to copy the other, but at least that there are possibilities because others have done in a different way. Nevertheless, we need to be extremely clear. If at present we would put in place immediate effort for austerity, so to reduce the debt, the result will be the worst possible scenario that we can imagine. We saw already in 2008 what an accelerated, unneeded, and actually harmful uh, efforts to immediately go towards um, austerity have produced. In reality, in many countries, particularly the OECD country, we have a period of almost stagnation that came before the crisis of COVID and now is even more exaggerated. And that's why, fortunately, a series of countries are uh, uh, now uh, promoting uh, general efforts, for example, in Europe, to a fund to help the recovery. My point is uh, fiscal reform are needed, but not now. What we need now is a new deal. What we need now is a global effort to relaunch the economy because the economy is not really taking off with the exception of some countries in Asia, including, for example, China, but not only, also Vietnam and others. With this exception, the rest is not coming. So we need to relaunch the economy and not now to put in place austerity, but after, then we will have to consider also for reason of autonomy, freedom, and, and sovereignty of countries to increase uh, the level of, of, of taxes. Now, the other question, uh, the domestic capacity. Domestic capacity in many cases, I was trying to say before, already exists and they are there and they have been there for years. The point is that we do not recognize them, we do not identify them, and we don't help this capacity to grow. I don't know one day as I am old now, I will have more time to think about it. I, I would like to understand why for the economies, the investors come always from the sky. They are never here. They are never people like you and me that live in uh, close and we are friends. No, they come always from the sky. And therefore we have to guarantee general condition for them and not for the people that are there. Domestic uh, capacity are in Africa, in many places, but we need to cultivate this capacity and to help them grow. We were mentioning tourism. It's obvious that there are capacity in East Africa already developed. The problem there will be that tourism is a reputational industry. Once you uh, invest and you build a reputation, you are successful. When there is a disaster, then you lose this reputation that you have built over time. And now the efforts will be to recreate the condition, but the assets are there. In other cases, the assets are not there. In other times, the tradition not identified, the capacity not identified are not there. And therefore we will need strong industrial policy from the state to create comparative advantages. Here, the example is very easy. Thanks to uh, Korea, South Korea, uh, South Korea was a, a country after the, the war that they had that have level of income per capita much lower than many African countries at that time. And today is one of the countries that has shown a capacity of industrialization the best. How did they produce it? By industrial policy, they create assets that were not there. Copying, obviously, also technology. Everybody has copied. England, uh, uh, France copied England. England uh, was copied by United States. United States were copied by Japan, and then not so on. So copying and then learning. That's the 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 two dimension. I would say identification of existing assets, uh, very often local, and the second is uh, creation of assets when uh, you think they are important comparative competitive elements. And in fact, digitalization has a lot to do with the second. Mario, that's a very extremely, I mean, uh, I thought extremely perceptive observations about capacity and assets and, uh, and how to build and cultivate them. That's something that, you know, I think it's going to be more important now than, than ever, I would say. Um, I have a question now again for Stephen, but this is not fortunately not on CG bottles. 
<laughs> so this is about a question that comes on gender and youth. And I thought I might ask you this question because UNECA has been doing so much work on this, that we know that the effect of the COVID has been particularly uh, detrimental on women compared to men. Um, there's also been the question of youth unemployment has come up. And so the question is first that what can we do about it? And then there's a question linked to that, that can the AFC FTA help? That's a tough one. I'm not sure whether we can think about the link between the AFC, FTA, and issues around youth and, gen and women. But if you could think a bit more about this and if you could respond, especially if UNECA has been doing some work, it'd be good to know about that also. Okay, uh, no, thank you. I think I tried, to, I, I, I had answered part of that question um, right. online. Uh, but let me say the following. Um, when um, the leadership of the continent met on December 5th uh, to prepare for the start of trading uh, on January 1 this year, one of the things that was agreed then was that um, we are going to have um, an African Union protocol of women in trade. Now, and this, this, this is not rhetoric. Uh, it's because statistics do show that African women are very much engaged in intra-African trade including some of the um, units that are used in the backyard to produce, um, to add value to some of the, for hair products or for beauty products or for whatever, there are a lot of women businesses that are involved, involved in that. And so there is a very intentional policy of ensuring that trade in Africa benefits women. So, so that's a very practical thing. And um, so we are going to work closely with the, with the FCFTA Secretariat, uh, the ACA, and of course the other organs of the, and anybody who wants to, to, to help in this, to work, to work towards that. That's on the, that's on the, that's on the, on the, on the and of course as CCA, we actually have a strategy of trade and gender. And I'm happy to share uh, to share more on that, because we do believe that um, on the whole question of uh, inclusion, I think everybody, whenever you think about trade, you have to also to think, um, wherever you are working, about this, um, uh, this inclusivity. For the youth, um, the phase two of the AFCFTA negotiations is going to tackle the questions of competition policy, intellectual property, e-commerce, and investment policy. Now, I would want to argue, and I think this is what I have responded in the, in the, on the, on the online, that uh, first and foremost, the e-commerce rules that are going to be developed are going to be very beneficial to the young people in Africa benefiting from digital trade and the digital economy. So whatever rules we come up with, we have to make sure that they are, they are, they are, they are youth friendly. And maybe one of the things that uh, we need to, to mention here is that this issue of digital identity becomes very critical. And I think uh, indirectly Moses was referring to it because it's one thing being a young person, but it's another thing you being a young person trying to trade from Ethiopia with Nigeria and mm. somebody questioning whether they can trust you because they do not have an ident your identity. But with a digital identity where African countries have a framework that recognizes these things, the young people would actually be included. The second thing is that um, the IP uh, rules that are going to be, to be there, they are going to be very critical to protecting the innovations and the commercialization of the innovations of the young people. And given that the young people now will have a whole continent to play with, I believe the AFCFTA is going to sort of give um, a platform uh, to scale up and even to test before you can compete with the best products out there within the continent. And, and I think this gives a platform to our young people to do this. So I don't know whether I have answered that question, 
but that's the way uh, I see it. Yeah. Very well, uh, Stephen. It was a very clear answer. Thank you so much. Okay, now actually we are a little bit out of time. I'm going to, but I'm going to do the following. I'm going to ask each of you what would be the one policy priority for African economies this year? Just one, in one minute. So one policy priority in one minute. That's the challenge. So let's start with Moses. Moses, one policy priority, perhaps for the Kenyan government, uh, but more generally this year. Wow, uh, that's a that's a <laughs> that's a very good one. I it will be if we focused on um, value chain by value chain. We are working on scarce resources. Um, if I had the power, I would say every year. Start with the market, understand the, the specs of our market, work backwards to produce as per the specs of the market, build the capacity of the producers, and you create the entire value chain. If you did that and you, you are able to succeed two value chains every year, you make them sustainable, within maybe five years, we can, we can solve a big part of the unemployment challenge. Thank you. Great answer. That's a great answer. Thank you so much. It's absolutely clear. Okay, Stephen, your, your turn. One policy priority this year. Oh, mine is mine is straightforward. Ratify the CFTA. Develop a strategy for how to benefit from the AFCFTA, and implement that strategy. Uh, it gives you degrees of freedom because you do not have the kind of degrees of freedom that developed countries have of enormous fiscal resources, but the AFCFTA is our fiscal resource. Thank you. Absolutely, that's a very good answer. I was going to say the same thing too. So it's really, really good we agree on this. Uh, Mario, one yes. more. Uh, the point is that I agree fully with my two friends. Uh, so, but <laughs> let me say just uh, uh, two additional points. The first is, Obviously, for a sustainable global economic recovery, the foremost priority now is to win the battle against the virus everywhere. So that's, but let me allow that for, uh, for a second. Uh, the ongoing digital and in general productive transformation must be part of a new deal for the global recovery. There will not be recovery if this will concern only few countries, doesn't matter where they are. Absolutely, thank you. Okay, I've, uh, I'm going to now call this panel to a close a little bit over time, but not very much. I know all of you are very busy and have other things to do. But uh, I just want to thank all of you very, you know, it was really wonderful, the interaction, the questions that came from the audience are superb, and they are, your responses were really, really very helpful. And uh, I think it's just uh, very good to, to think about, you know, we, we, what we are, where we are right now, we have quite a bit of a good sense of what the challenges are. And also perhaps, as we have just discussed now, some possible policy uh, solutions, which some of which may be within reach, some of be a bit more challenging, but certainly something we can, one can think of doing in the, in the next few, uh, the next year, if not the next few months. Thank you so much, Moses and Mario. That was a wonderful panel. I really enjoyed uh, moderating it, moderating it. I look forward to seeing you again, whenever we're Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Moses. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. 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 Bye. Thank you.